The murder of George Floyd one year ago today ignited a national and international movement for social justice and renewed a dialogue about racism. Tonight, the WRL documentary team shares personal experiences of racism from people in our own communities in their own words. Racism is an act of prejudice. The act of, of bringing someone down, uh, making them feel less human because of the color of their skin or the way that they look. It's a system that um, where laws and policies are put in place to elevate those who identify as white and to oppress those who identify as people of color. El racismo is racism is when someone discriminates against you cuando ellos when they think they can take away your right to live, your right to live a happy and healthy life. Racism is intolerance of each other's differences as human beings, and that frequently comes out in some form of hatred. When I hear the word racism, I think of being treated unfairly. The racism is taught is not uh, is not something that we're born with. Racism is really is a false construct. My parents moved from North Carolina to Virginia. Many times my mother would not always come back to North Carolina to visit, see her family, and etc. And if she didn't decide to come to North Carolina, then she would always make preparations for me to ride the bus. We were always seated in the back whenever we were to get off the bus for a snack or for refreshments. We were the last to get off. The whites were in the front and they would get off and get their food and would have time enough to be seated. We had to get the food from the little window that was cut in the back of the establishment. And then we would have to eat our food standing up or in the bus or wherever. But this is the way the system was conceived, that this race is better or above or superior to the black race. And I thought, this should not be, because I felt that I was just as good as anyone else. I served 20 years in the United States Air Force. I'm an Iraq and Afghanistan war veteran. My father served in Vietnam. My grandfather served in the Korean War, and my great-grandfather served in World War II. I was assigned to the Air Force Special Operations Command at Herberfield, Florida. It was around 1996, and one day I was assigned to direct traffic due to a situation dealing with some explosive ordinances. Everyone could drive forward, they could make a right turn, but they were forbidden from being able to make a left turn. A vehicle pulled forward and insisted on making a left turn. And I emphasized to a sergeant maybe three or four times, sir, you cannot make a left turn. And as that sergeant drove off, he began to call me all kinds of N-words. I said, halt, in my command voice. I approached the vehicle and when I did, the sergeant continued to yell at me, berate me, continually calling me in words. He spit on my boots, he spit on my uniform, and when I went to get his ID card from him, he told me that an N word couldn't touch his, his ID card and he spit on my hand. And eventually he was going to spit in my face. I was informed that he had been released from the Air Force a few weeks later. I felt really hurt. It brought back those memories of what my 
father, my grandfather, or my great-grandfather, and what they went through. And it made me realize that, that I still have to go through those things today. When I arrived in uh, 2015, I started to look for getting the license, uh, driving license. Every time I was like trying to submit my paperwork, it was something else that they were asking me. It was really frustrating. The way I got my license was finally when my wife told me, well, I'm gonna help you because she was born here, she's white, she looks like European. She just like, okay, this doesn't seem normal, so I'm gonna try to go with you at your appointment. And the, the time she went, it was kind of straightforward to, to go to, through the process. Reviewing the, the paperwork, I started to make some questions and she was your answering like, yeah, he lives here, he, we live together. And it was like, just, yeah, okay, so everything seems fine and just do your driving test and that's it. And I realized <laughs> after that event, like, um, that just having my wife there, the way they kind of saw me was completely uh, different. They immediately knew, knew like, probably that, that she knew better the rights that someone has at the DMV and, and, and that probably they can get away with me, and, but not with her. To me, that was kind of racism. I was born in Miami, Florida to Indian immigrant parents who moved here in the late 70s. I've faced racism in mainly what I would call microaggressive ways. It frequently will show up uh, in a number of situations, whether it's a job interview, whether it's meeting new friends. Sometimes even vendors will say they're surprised that I can speak English as well as I can when I open my mouth to talk. In October of 2016, I had gone to a produce stand to purchase a pumpkin that I wanted to carve for Halloween with some friends. And I proceeded to pay for the pumpkin that I had picked out, and I asked if the vendor would take my card to pay for the pumpkin that I had chosen. And he, along with his colleague, looked at me and said, square in the face, no, we don't take cards, but we will take curry and then proceeded to say, yeah, isn't that your currency where you're from? Don't you pay for things with curry? Um, and I was just so, I guess, flabbergasted that somebody could ask me that and left the premises pretty quickly after. I felt very hurt. I think people like to call, you know, small incidents and daily incidents microaggressions, but Frankly, they're aggressions. You know, where are you really from? Which is a common sort of question that I get. When I was in journalism school at University of Oregon, when I was covering a story with another reporter, and when we got to the location to interview this individual, this individual said, why is he here? He doesn't even speak English, which was shocking. And when I started talking, he said, oh, you speak English very really well which even was more shocking. And I said, well, I, I think you would speak English this well if, you, if English was your first language. It was a put down. He saw the Asian, he didn't see the American. And that really made me mad, it hurt. There was this bus that we would uh, follow going to school. And each morning, either when we go to school or coming from school, we get caught behind the school bus. I think I was in elementary school, maybe junior high. But one day, we were coming from school, and the bus stopped to let the kids off. They saw us, they looked at us, and they screamed out the N-word and some other not-so-nice words at us. Never met us didn't know us, but just because of that little melanin in my skin, they said that word. When, when a, a, a white person really says that word to you, it really is saying that you're not really fully human. That's something that I always remembered, and I came to find out that that school was a Christian school. And I think that kind of speaks to a, a larger problem when it comes to race.
when I was a child in our hometown with my father, uh, the two of us were in our car and I think some folks in the, in the community knowing who my father was and who we were as a family and what car we drove uh, targeted us and uh, actually shot multiple times into our car. Really, it was all based on uh, the color of our skin. And when the police arrived to uh, my father's car being shot up, um, they were just in, just fully dismissive of the fact that a shooting had actually happened, um, that you know the shooting was targeting uh, our family. There was never a police report written up and, and nothing after that. Uh, this was in Ashboro, North Carolina. Uh, that's where I grew up. There were a lot of incidents growing up. My parents had owned a number of restaurants, uh, one of those being in Ashboro. They were targeted multiple times by the same people, property being burned, restaurant being broken into, us being followed home after getting off of work. I remember distinctively riding around downtown with my dad and, and just uh, hearing uh, racial slurs and, and just really uh, nasty things being said to us having all of that around us really made us feel less human. In 1965, I went off to Winston-Salem State University and I was telling them about the, the Ku Klux Klan signs. I skinned up a utility pole and, and pulled down one of their signs and I've kept that sign until today. In 1968, I was probably 22 years old. I had a very good friend of mine whose name was Alan Curran. He and I were very close. He was a white boy, and uh, but we were very close friends. We hunted together. We did a lot of things together. And I visited his home. He would visit my home. We ate at each other's houses, that kind of thing. And I was going to meet him, and uh, when I met him, he was crying, and uh, I wanted to know what was going on. And he told me that Herbert, you and I can't meet like this anymore because my buddies are telling me that you've been hanging out with the, the N-word person. It was, it was sad and it was, I mean, it was just like somebody broke my arm because we were just that close. And we'd been doing things together even with those other fellows and then all of a sudden my color makes a difference in how we fellowship with one another. I was playing with my friend. I don't think he's my friend anymore now. He was a white kid I was playing with at the time who I thought was really cool. He told me that if my mom sees me, then she's gonna freak out. I just get scared and I run over to my mom. I hide behind her. And I explained to her what um, he told me. I immediately felt in my heart that it was because he was black. I just feel horror and I'm terrified and I don't want to get hurt just because of my skin color. I wanted to hear more and unearth what um, the child was trying to communicate and as that process was happening the mother was coming down the street um, and so the child became very anxious and hopped on his bike and um, as the mother was approaching the child took off on the bike. And I was like, why, why are you hiding behind me? And he said, I don't want her to see that I'm black. And I said, baby, we're black. She can see it from over there. And I remember Zion asking me, mama, was that racism? My heart broke for him. I was sad because it happened to him, but I was happy that he could name it for himself. I remember I had a teacher who sometimes would do roll call by going through their middle names. So my middle name is my Korean name. Of course, when he gets to it, it's butchered and the whole class would also just like butcher my name too. And in that moment, I'm like, okay, it's funny, but what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to say? Just moments like that where I feel like I'm alone. I can't really stand up for myself and my friends don't really stand up for me either. I would definitely get a lot of comments saying, like, you don't have to study a lot because you're Asian, you're automatically smart. Or if I'm in a group project or something, I'm always expected to do most of the work um, because I'm uh, automatically smart. For me, it kind of invalidates the fact that I do work hard and I do study for things. I don't, I don't just make good grades or I'm not successful because I'm Asian. There is hard work that is put into it and I study, I put in practice 
just like anybody else. And to have my success and accomplishments be attributed to my race, it's kind of invalidating. So I feel like I have to work extra hard to seek approval, I guess. I felt discriminated against when I asked for a home. I felt discriminated when they asked for payment, when I had already given the money. And the owners of the apartment only wanted me to leave. Because when I bought the money orders at the higher price, they didn't want the money. They wanted me to leave. And I felt very isolated and I felt alone. Like I didn't have the right to have a good place to live where I would like to be with my family. I'm a mother. I have a daughter who's seven years old. In that time, she was a baby. She was two years old. And when they said I needed to leave the apartment, it was in the month of November. A cold month. And... I didn't know where to go at that moment. What hurt me the most was wondering where to have my daughter at the time. When I arrived, I wanted change. We come here, the majority of us, to be able to progress or have a more dignified life. And you never expect someone to discriminate against you for your appearance or for your language or for being a migrant or looking for a better future. So you don't think you have any racial bias? Go to WRLDocumentary.com and take an implicit bias test and see your results. You'll also find an interview with an implicit bias expert. And you'll hear from a Raleigh attorney who says implicit bias training changed his perspective on race. You can also join the conversation by following WRL Doc on Facebook and Twitter. You have heard people sharing personal stories of racial discrimination. Now hear ideas from those people for potential solutions to this complicated problem. I believe that we need to do a better job of communication, a better job of sitting down to the table, understanding each other. I think it starts with uh, awareness. It starts with a recognition and an acknowledgement of where we are as a country. Because only then can you move towards progress. I think a small step towards um, any sort of solution to racism is for all of us to have just an ounce of empathy and understand that we all deserve to be treated as humans. I think the other solution is to learn about each other's differences and actually be willing and open to have the conversation, to say, tell me about your country or tell me about where you're from. I think the community or the people who like to discriminate people, I think they need to give themselves some time to get to know other cultures, to meet other people. That way they can see that we're all equal, that we all have feelings. We can work together to be a more decent and enriched community. I do think individuals can learn and educate themselves. It takes a lot of effort to go out of your way to learn something, especially for white people because they don't live through this. We need our fellow uh, brothers and sisters who are white. We need them to speak out. Everyone has to talk about it, and everyone has to acknowledge it. I think there are some things that need to change within the
public school system that we need to teach the truth about the history of our nation and uh, not just whitewashed truth. And I think we need to do an overhaul in the curriculum that we teach because it is very much a Eurocentric curriculum and it makes black and brown children feel as if we don't matter. It, and it makes white children feel as if black and brown children don't matter too. It's time for us to have these conversations in all aspects of our society, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics. We have to get past this together. You have to have courageous, heartfelt, open, and honest conversation. Love is the key.